Hello to everybody. Welcome to one of the dialogues organized by Book City Milan 2020 uh, within the frame of what we decided to call Terra Nostra, so Our Earth, a series of events uh, dedicated to the environmental crisis and to the Anthropocene and its social impact. Um, it's a great pleasure for me, it's a privilege to, to talk today with Richard Leakey, connected from Nairobi. Richard Leakey uh, really doesn't need any introduction, however, is, is one of the, mainly for, for the young uh, people connected, he's one of the prominent paleontologists in the world. Uh, he grew up in a family of very famous paleontologists who searched for, for fossil traces of human history uh, in Tanzania, uh, in the old Dubai Gorge for all their lives. And Richard himself discovered some of the most important uh, fossils for understanding human evolution in Turkana uh, Lake, uh, Basin, and, and other sites in, in, in Africa, in Eastern Africa. Um, as chief of the Kenya Wildlife Service, Richard, uh, have to say, fought against powerful enemies to prevent the, for example, the ivory trade in Africa and the destruction of African ecosystems. Um, so anyway, the study of human evolution and, and the protection of wildlife remain uh, the two great missions of, of his life. But I have to say that the last of his dreams is another one is, is, is a large and wonderful museum dedicated to humanity, which will stand right on the edge of, of the Rift Valley, near to Nairobi, near to the area where Homo sapiens uh, was born. So it, it's wonderful, we will talk about it um, very shortly. So thanks so much, Richard, for accepting our invitation. And my, my first question for you is related to biodiversity. Um, in 1995, so 20 years ago, together with Roger Lewin, you published a very important fundamental book, The Sixth Extinction, where you explained that after the big five mass extinction of the past, so the, the great catastrophes due to global uh, eco ecological uh, changes and, and, and upheavals that destroyed much of the biodiversity, today we are in in the middle of the sixth mass extinction. This time, not due to asteroids or volcanoes, but to the activity of Homo sapiens. And the data seems to prove, unfortunately, that you were right. Uh, I, I'd like to start with the data, with, with a new data, because two weeks ago, exactly two weeks ago, so very recently, the most important scientific societies dealing with fisheries, um, aquatic biodiversity, and so on, published a statement uh, in which they asked for urgent action against climate change and, and, and so on. And they update the data on biodiversity in the seas. And these data are terrible. I, I will mention to you just a couple. Um, they say that from 1970 to 2014, more than 80% of fish water biodiversity was lost in terms of abundance of populations. And the second one is that if the trend continues to be the same, by 2050, so the mid of century, we will have lost 90% of the coral reefs. So very worrying. You write that the balance is broken forever because we humans are too many in the world. So what do you think of this data? Uh, what do you think about the six mass extinction today? And what actions uh, should we take right now for you? And thanks again. Well, it's a pleasure to talk with you. I think you couldn't be on a more important subject. My first observation is that whilst the scientists have published and the scientific societies have published some very frightening data about the extraordinary loss of biodiversity, both in the sea and elsewhere, I think it's an underestimate. I mean, I, th I don't think... They've counted them. And I think in reality, it's much worse than they're saying. And so that's the first point I want to make. And it's extremely difficult to see how we could possibly reverse it uh, in the time that is necessary to sustain most of it. 
I think the, you put your finger on the main point, and that's there are too many people. And it's not just that there are too many people, but the majority of the world want more to eat, they want a better standard of living, they want more resources, and we somehow have to find a way to restrain the appetite for growth. And I think we have to somehow recognize that unless we can set aside some of the great biological reserves, like the ocean national parks in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, like some of the, the uh, protection of the coral reefs from overfishing, and more importantly, well not more importantly, but as important, stop cutting down trees in forests to grow soy, soybeans and, and, and corn, and somehow find an alternative to the taking of old land and putting it under the plow, I think we're a doomed species. And I think the point that I'd like to make, and I also talked about it and wrote about it in 1992, is that as we force species out of their natural habitat into extinction, in 1992, uh, I predicted, along with a number of other people, that this was forcing evolution to accelerate in certain species. Uh, the viruses are the example. And this corona pandemic is simply because a virus has jumped from one species to another. And I said in 1992 that I would fully expect that before the end of the century, and I was wrong, it's a little later, not much later, um, there would be an airborne virus that could eliminate masses and masses of people. All right, we're talking about over 100 million. It could be much worse. And don't for a minute think that Corona-19 is the last of these viruses. They're more coming. And we've got to be learn, we have to learn and teach discipline. We have to realize that uh, isolation, uh, that um, strict discipline on hygiene and strict discipline on environmental destruction are critical to survival. And people say, that, well, you know, God looks after us. Well, I'm not a religious man, but I was taught by some very religious people that God only is going to look after those who look after themselves. And we're not doing that either. Yeah, you have just said that a very interesting uh, thing. You are among the scientists or the science writers, for example, like, like David Quammen with Spillover, that predicted uh, many years ago uh, some events like pandemics uh, and, and, and so on. So what do you think are the reasons why people around the world uh, were not able to listen to this, uh, to this prediction and, and were not able to learn from, from what scientists were, were saying to, to, to the audience? It's hard to answer your question, and, and there's no simple answer, but I, I do think uh, our education systems in every country are at fault. Uh, we, we somehow give people the sense that they have a choice in, in how they do things. And I suppose, because this is a short interview, I would today point a finger very seriously at the, the internet and uh, Facebook and some of these new techniques that young people, not just young people, people uh, look for simple answers. You push a button and it tells you what you want to know. You don't understand what it's telling you. You don't understand where the data came from and say, well, that's okay, move on. I, I think we've just lost any sense of the hard facts, real facts of life and death and, and, and balances. And we can never, we can never go back to being in balance with nature. That's a misnomer. It's a, it's, a, it's a figure of the imagination. We're out of balance. All we can do is exploit the world slightly more cautiously to allow other systems to continue. And if we don't, it's to our peril. And, and you know, people don't believe that humans can become extinct. My friend, it's perfectly possible for the planet to be without any humans at all, not so far from now. And does it matter? Well, if you're going to heaven, it doesn't matter. 
to going to hell in May matter, to going nowhere it doesn't matter. So I don't think we should be complacent about this. We could disappear as a species within a historical period. Yeah, uh, according to many, you are right, absolutely. According to many observers, it's exactly that's the point that we are in, we are dealing with a non-linear, global, uh, very complex uh, problem with, with complex dynamics that that are in the opposite side with respect to the facility to the easy way to to to, to debate in in the in the web so that, that's the point so in, anyway in europe i don't know in africa or or in other states but in europe we are struggling to make clear that this spillover pandemic uh, uh, came from from the deforestation from the illegal trade in endangered animals uh, which are then brought to wet markets without any uh, hygiene conditions and so on. And we know that in Africa, these trades are, um, feed warlords and terrorist organizations and so on. So uh, practically, uh, according to you, what should we do to eliminate uh, these remote causes? And, so, and, and what is the situation in Kenya, in, in Kenya uh, as well? In Kenya, we, 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 we face uh, less worrying problems today. I'm not sure about tomorrow, but certainly um, bush meat, animals, um, antelope particularly, um, are being killed off in extraordinary numbers because people are hungry. And people can't afford to buy beef. They can't afford to buy lamb or pork. Uh, even chickens are getting very expensive here. So I think we must realize that uh, the economic condition of the majority of humanity suggests that they're always going to, particularly if the numbers increase, want to get things that are cheaper or free. And if you can steal it from the bush or steal it from the ocean, uh, you will do so. And I think the, the, the governments we set up around the world have a far greater responsibility to recognize the relationship between underdevelopment, extreme poverty when it comes to putting food on the table, and 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 where you're going to source this from. Now, I think if we deal with the economic condition of the majority of people, we've shown historically that family sizes come down. And if you're trying to feed two children or one child, it's very different from if you're feeding 15. And, and the norm in Africa is very large families because of the economic hardships that they face. And for some reason, the human mind doesn't register. But you know, in, 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 in this country, Kenya, my country, a lot of the poor people will say, well, you know, if I have one child, he may get sick and die. If I have three children, I have a better chance. But I have 10, even if three die, um, the other seven, some of them will look after us in our old age. Now, if you've got an alternative to old age, and if you've got an alternative to the economic welfare, even a basic level, you're going to stop some of the bad practice that is common in the majority of, of the populations around the world. And I think this is something that government haven't come to terms with. I also think that, and I know you didn't ask the question, but I think it's worth pointing out, that we don't believe, well, a lot of people don't believe, that if the climate gets warmer, the ice caps will melt. If they melt, more water is in circulation in the atmosphere, you get more dramatic weather, but more importantly, uh, Telmo, is the, the ocean levels are coming up. And if you put a block of ice on something in the glass and you let it get to room temperature, it'll overflow. Now, the oceans are coming up. I cannot think of a single metropolitan city on planet Earth that serves as the way to bring food into the country and to take produce out of the country that won't be underwater in 50 years. Um, you're, you're, we worry about Venice getting the paintings wet. My goodness, Boston is going to go, London is going to go, all of these. <laughs> Thank you. I apologize for that. Uh, all these great cities are going to go underwater. Now, what sort of economy do the nations of the world, the West in particular, but not only China, what, what can we do to build new ports? Well, you can't that there are no deep water troughs that will develop quick enough or can be excavated quick enough, and the ports will close down. Now, what then, Tillman, 
happens to humanity. And I think we've got to slap our face and wake up. We're in trouble. And the trouble is 50 to 100 years time. Uh, we're not, we worry about losing 100 million people to corona. My goodness, what will you lose if the sea level comes up 10, 15, 20 meters? The lot, the economy will go. You can't make money that has the value of money in the time that's left to us. Yeah, that that's fun. Yeah, that basically. So uh, I agree. And, and and so you you say that uh, it's very hard to defend the environment where there is so much poverty, so much poverty. So uh, what can we do in, in in the rich countries in North America, in Europe, or or maybe in China? Because in Europe, for example, many criticize criticize the fact that the tourism. Uh, in Africa, in safari parks and so on, is only for rich people without any positive effect on local population. So how, what can we do in terms of tourism, for example, in Africa or, or, or where biodiversity is? I, you know, I, I've, I've heard that complaint that tourism only benefits the rich. But the point is, it, it benefits the rich very much because they get a lot of pleasure. Why shouldn't 80% of the population get rich enough to enjoy it too. I mean, if you give people in Kenya money to spend, as opposed to money that just buys enough food, Kenyans will buy vehicles. And, and the kids who are at school directly or through the internet are saying, mommy or daddy, what can we do at the weekend? School's closed. Well, if you've got the money, and you can take your car, you go into a national park where the tourists go, you see lion and you see elephant and you see other, other wildlife. And, and the kids come back really happy and really tuned in to the problem. But if you're only earning a few dollars a month and you can hardly feed your children, except from the, the city wastes, then how can you enjoy wildlife? And the point is coming back to one I made earlier, and that is unless we can change the economic outlook for the majority of humanity, we can't sustain the wildlife and natural areas like the oceans against over exploitation. And I think, again, it brings me to a topic I, you and I have discussed before, but we still think if we're sitting in, 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 in America, uh, that what happens in Africa is Africa's problem. If you're sitting in Italy, yeah, you, you've dealt a little bit better with, with possibly racism. But the point is, it's one species on one planet. And while well, you can sit very happily in London eating three meals a day. If the majority of, of people of Africa or Asia or South America and Central America aren't eating anything except one meal a week that's sustainable, then, then how can we sort of expect the planet to survive and your good life won't survive? And I'm not suggesting we should all go back to eating one meal a day, but money is only something that's been around for a few thousand years. Can't we think of another way where we, we take responsibility for the welfare of humanity itself? Now, I'm, I'm past the age where I want to take on that, that fight. But there are a lot of young people coming to your, your book fair who need to think about the reality of the future. The reality of, will they, not just children and great-grandchildren, but great-great-grandchildren. We can look back six or seven hundred years can we look forward a hundred years with confidence? But this is what I think somehow, what you're trying to do with, with the publicity you're giving it and your lectures and, and your books, uh, we've got to do more to persuade people in Milan, people in, 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 in San Paolo, or people in Sydney, people in Nairobi, they've got to realize that the future is in, 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 in the hands of the next generation. And we can't just deny it to them by being arrogant, which we are. I mean, the situation in America, a majority of people of Caucasian origin don't care about the, the, the welfare of the majority of people who came over to, to the United States as slaves. And yet, as you know from your paleontological work, even the Caucasians like Trump, if it goes back genetically, a few, you know, a few generations, he's got African ancestry. And how dare we say that he's different? He is different because he's stupid, but that's his only difference. That's great. So let's go in the final part of our conversation to your great projects. Uh, can you explain to the Italian audience what is the, the Wildlife Direct? 
project and the organization for a wildlife defense? Wildlife, sorry, I didn't hear the first part. Wildlife Direct, right? Wildlife Direct was simply originally an idea to enable people to contribute to an organization where the money went directly to the, people, the, the project. I was getting tired when I was running my life of seeing big charities raising money uh, for, for various projects like Extinction, but they were actually raising money to pay the staff who, who were trying to raise the money. And, and, and there was very little benefit going to the species on the ground. And I think Wildlife Direct was an attempt, and I don't think it succeeded completely, an attempt to, to raise some money for, for uh, small projects where, where a local herdsman wants to build um, a, a, some, a device to protect his cattle from lions at night and it's just blinking light and he needed you know, a few thousand dollars to do that. That sort of money was much more difficult to get than the inflated salaries of some other conservationists and, and, and people around the world who were who are sitting on top and needing to, it's like, you know, the famine in Africa, um, organizations like the Red Cross and some of the others, you know, if there's a famine coming, what they're more worried about is, of course, they want to give food to the people, but they also want to maintain their staff with salaries. And so you, you exaggerate the seriousness of the crisis. The money comes in, the famine's long since passed, but people get a paycheck that's slightly bigger. So I tried to set up something that was a, a more direct conduit between the donor and, and the needy, but I don't know, I think it was an uphill struggle, quite honestly. Great. We will publish the link uh, with, with this do. conversation of the It's of a good organization, you could still do a lot. Uh, sure. And, and, and another one here is the Turkana Basin Initiative. That is great. So you, you founded this, this initiative for hosting young researchers in, in Africa, right? For studying human evolution. Yes, uh, many years ago, um, when I started work at Lake Turkana, it was a long journey to get up to one of the richest sites for investigation in the world. And it, you'd spend several weeks getting up there, getting established, and several weeks getting back. People were often quite uncomfortable um, in their small tents and sleeping out. And so as I got older, and I suppose preferred comfort myself, we decided it'd be nice to have a, a research institute where people could fly out or, or go up from the universities in Nairobi or Af African countries and go straight to the field, um, do their work, at the end of the day or the end of the week, have a rest, come back again, where there were aeroplane access and, 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 and where the fossils stayed where we were finding them. And, and in the old days, 50 years ago, 20 years ago, if you found a fossil, you brought it back to the city, the museum. And uh, the scientists of the world, the scientists of Kenya would look at them and say, well, well, well wonderful. But there's no benefit to the people in whose area you had found these fossils. And so I thought it would be good to give the stakeholders whose land we're searching over for fossils a, ch a chance to benefit, not directly in terms of cost knowledge, but more importantly, jobs, uh, jobs of technicians, jobs of researchers, assistants, some would go on to university with scholarships we're providing. And we've made um, paleontology in Kenya at any rate, I think in East Africa, and Africa generally, much more available to the indigenous uh, citizens than it was previously. It was, it was a subject for the elite from the West. It's not anymore. And, and, you know, I think having an institute where the work is being done and where the people around it can benefit was a very important thing to do. And, and I think the Turkana Basin Institute today stands alone in the world, being an institute on the ground facility for scientific investigation. Great. I reserve a visit for me for, for the future. Anytime there's a bed waiting. <laughs> So finally, uh, you are planning, as already said, a wonderful museum of humankind that will rise on the edge of Rift Valley. And the name is Ngaren, which means origins in, in Turkana language. So how is the project going on and what are the next steps? So what's new about the museum? Well, the project is very complicated. I think the reason there is no such facility in the world is it's rather more complicated than I thought. Um, I would like to establish beyond any doubt at all that what you're looking at is real. And I want to eliminate from people's mind that there's a choice between 
accepting evolution or not accepting evolution. It, it's in your face. Uh, it's there. You will see it. Now, I think there's some wonderful films that have been made, but you know, you can turn it off. If you have a movie, whether it's on Facebook or any other medium, when you've had enough, you switch it off. Now, I was recently in a Scandinavian country looking at an exhibit that had just been opened within the last 10 years of Ice Age dioramas of, of woolly mammoths and some great exhibits. And I mean, it was one of the more convincing things I've ever seen as a museum visitor. And while I was standing in the hall and watching, a group of, of children, teenagers came in, about 20 of them, and they put their noses against the glass to look at this diorama. And, and they were talking amongst themselves. And then several of them said, okay, let's see the next exhibit. And instead of going around the corner, they put their hands on the glass and tried to, to swipe it so something else would come back. And it made me realize, you know, we're in an age of stupidity. And so I thought we should do something that you can't switch off and that you can't swipe. I would like to have a facility where you go to an excavation, like they have in Rome, I think, one of, one of the old Roman houses, and, and you put on a pair of simple, cheap glasses, and suddenly the room becomes alive. And um, you go through the room, and you, you're sitting on your chair, and you pick your feet up so you don't stub your toes. But it's the same room. You're sitting on a chair like this. But, but when you come out of that, you end up in Nero's garden, for example. And you come out and say, that, that's real. I saw it. Now, I would like to go into an excavation where there's a, some bones, and one of the bones of a skeleton, perhaps of Homo erectus, and the bones come to life, they form a skill, they stand up, and you're there with them. And, and, and the Homo erectus boy says, come, come with me. And he takes you into a Pleistocene, early Pleistocene uh, landscape. And says, Those are Australopithecines, and they're wandering around. He says, I can't talk to them because they're different, but they're very important. And if you come over here, you'll see my family. And they, they're using stone tools to cut something. And, and then he says, and what are you doing? And you say, there'll be a, a, a technical device to, to enable you to have a brief conversation. And then you ask him about his ancestors and say, well, I don't have archaeologists, but we know a little bit about what they were doing. And, 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 and this whole story, my friend, with your arm around him, is so real that you've got to understand and go around that corner where you'll find somebody else. Now, I think if you could do something like that, and the technology exists, Nobody who saw it would be unmoved. And if in addition there are exhibitions that show real fossils, real things, real movies, virtual reality, immersive reality, about human origins in Africa and about the origin of life with dinosaurs coming out of the sea, and, and, and you can go up to outer space and see the planet, the little blue planet, uh, You'll come away from there, change forever. And I would like to do that, and I'd like to do it in Africa. The biggest problem is persuading people to spend the money. We need about 150 million US dollars to build this in one of the most spectacular pieces of real estate I could find. Um, we will do it. Uh, it's going to take time. And uh, you and the people who are reading this article and seeing the films, will help me because we have to do it. It's part of trying to persuade people of different origins, people of different races, people of different languages, cultures. They were all one. We came out of millions of years. And unless we change the way we're thinking, we don't have hundreds of years going forward. Yeah, that's a wonderful idea of museum. I totally agree. We have already experiences in, in, in Europe that if you mix together the real things with augmented reality and immersive virtual reality, the, 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 if the effect it, it is wonderful for Yang Jane. So if you apply I, I, it to, we must apply it to evolution because it's never been done. Biological evolution yeah. is something that people will only understand if they can actually get into it. Yeah, exactly. So we, we are ready to help in any way from Italy. Thank you. Of course. Thank uh, you so very much. Just a final message. What, what is the cultural impact of celebrating our African origins for you? What's, what's the, the, the main cultural message for, that we will see in the museum? Well, I hope that you will do two things. One is come away realizing that prejudice on how somebody looks or speaks is stupid. 
and come away recognizing that whoever you see around you has the same ancestry, so that there's a, a, an effort to unify and have a oneness of humanity. That's one. Two, I hope that you come away, although we won't put it in, in print or put it in your face, that you know, we went around, we spent three hours in this museum. We saw evolution. We're now beginning to really believe it. And the people who designed this never mentioned God. There's a perfectly rational explanation for everything we see about us. Now, I don't want to criticize something that's hugely important to so many people, but it's not going to save the planet. As we said earlier, we have to realize that if there is a God who helps those who help themselves, it is us. And we can explain where we came from and the future is in our hands, not the Almighty's. Yeah, the idea of responsibility, that, that's wonderful. So thank you, Richard. It was great as always. It's a great pleasure to talk with you. We hope to see you soon in Italy and, and, and I hope that the Italian audience will be able to help uh, your wonderful projects. So thank you again. Well, you're Africans too, you know, you must help out. Thank you. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. See you soon. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.